want to welcome people to the 216th birthday class. We want to welcome back Chris Sapa. Chris is a re Lamont Research Professor in Ocean and Climate Physics and lecturer in Earth and Environmental Sciences. He does research about air-sea interactions, wave dynamics, wave breaking, near-sea turbulence on heat, gas, and momentum transport, infrared remote sensing, upper ocean processes, and estuarine processes. He received his PhD from University of Washington in applied ocean physics, oh. did a postdoc fellowship at Woods Hole in 2003. He's a Columbia Engineering School graduate. Is that right, Chris? It is, I am. Mechanical engineering, yes. I got a bunch of my family that are graduates from the engineering school. Chris has previously talked to us about the Ice Bridges Project and Oasis. And we have uh, on his website or on the Earth to Class website, links to a bunch of videos about what he's doing today. So let me get back and turn things over to Chris. Okay, Chris, you can share the screen if you want. All right, let me start right in, okay. Let's see, let me get to my top of the page. So I was gonna, um, what's, the, what's the target time frame you wanna shoot for this? We'll try to finish by about 11.30. And I welcome interrupting questions. Don't wait till the end. Don't worry, we've got a bunch of interrupters yeah. here. Good. So I'll let leave that to you, Michael, to get me to stop. <laughs> or wait, because <clears throat> I don't know if I can, when I, when I start this, when I put it on my screen and then I start to share, I can hold on. I need to do this. Do the other way around. Share screen. Share this. Share. <clears throat> so today I want to um, share with you my work in using drones or unoccupied um, aerial vehicles to how and how I use it to study climate our climate system and. It's um, when you come away from this that it, it provides a whole new dimension of how we can look at the problems or the problems that I'm interested in and what kind of a, um, a larger perspective we're able to to get. Um, and my the team over here is um, the first three are engineers, and this was a postdoc, and here's a graduate student. They've all worked on this project. Um, in general with the UAVs and, and this project in Fiji specifically. And I'm, if I, we have time, I'll make a link back up to Alaska, which I talked about last year. <clears throat> there we go. So why do we care about air sea exchange? Um, the processes are of in, in air sea interaction are a major controlling factor in both global climate and regional weather. And this has a major impact on many aspects of human life, including fisheries, shipping, coastal flooding, military operations, etc. And when I'm what do I mean by air sea interaction? Well, specifically, um, the wind is your driving force. Well, the sun is the driving force, it heats the ocean. Um, it also sets up temperature gradients um, and in the atmosphere that generate wind. And the wind blows on the ocean, it generates waves, those waves grow, they eventually break, they inject bubbles, they mix up the ocean. The wind also generates surface currents, and those surface currents mix up the near surface ocean. Um, and they also generate secondary flow, secondary circulations, sometimes called Langmuir circulation, which also mix up the ocean. 
Um, we have a you have sensible heat flux uh, transfer between the ocean and the atmosphere. You have evaporation, um, and you have precipitation from um, rain, <clears throat> which injects fresh water into the near surface, um, as well as mix, mixes up the surface as well. So all these processes are are ongoing, and we want to understand how they fit into or why they're important to the climate system. So at the surface, the upper 30 feet of the water column, so about up top 10, 10 meters, is the same weight as the whole atmosphere above. Um, <clears throat> and bubbles created by breaking waves dissolve and gases are absorbed by the oceans. So not only do bubbles break, um, inject um, gas into the ocean, just the turbulence in general absorbs carbon from and other gases from the atmosphere. And why do we care about, well, the oceans are the second largest reservoir of carbon after the Earth's crust. And I just want to focus on these two arrows right here. This one here, which is, it says 90 going out. So 90 gigatons of carbon go out of the ocean in general. And then 92 go in if you average over the whole globe. And so these are two really large numbers in different directions. But, and the, the difference is what's important. So how much is taken up by the ocean? So you, you can imagine, you can see that a, a, a very small change in our understanding of the processes at the surface will maybe have a bigger, big impact on what this flux is or uptake by the ocean. So this gives a sense of what the global flux of CO2 looks like at every, this is a map of the flux. So you can see in certain areas like here near the equator, this is lots of carbon going into the uh, coming out of the ocean um, so anywhere it's kind of reddish and yellowish that's where carbon is coming out and where it's blue and purple is where all the carbon's going in so you can see there's lots of there's hot spots in both directions across around the, uh, around the globe and we want to understand what there's two factors that go into me measuring the flux or understanding the flux. One is how much <clears throat> carbon there is in the ocean and the atmosphere to begin with, and how fast the rate of transfer is at the surface. So if there's more carbon in the atmosphere and there's a fast rate of transfer, that carbon will go into the ocean and vice versa. So this is what I'm really focused on studying this, this K, which is called the gas transfer velocity. And this gas transfer velocity has typically been parameterized using wind speed. <clears throat> and here you can see at low wind speeds, all these the data state are re reasonably close, but as you get up to higher wind speeds, there's lots of scatter. And different, there have formed different relationships over the last 20, 30 years. Um, some are like a linear relationship with wind speed of this the rate of transfer. Some show a quadratic with wind speed, so u squared, and some show a cubic or u cubed. So this is the fastest rate that people have seen, and this is kind of <clears throat> this is the rather slowest. <clears throat> but what this says to me is, oh, there's some must be something else going on other than wind speed, because if wind speed can't collapse all this data, it must be something else. And just to show what this difference in these different ways of parameterizing how fast the transfer is, you can get a variation of 1.2 gigatons of carbon uptake per year all the way up to nearly 2.7, depending on which of those relationships we use. So you can see there is a sensitivity to understanding this, this uh, rate of transfer. So we did a, a study in the North Atlantic up here near Greenland. Here's that little red dot, not my dot, but the other one that's moving around there. And <clears throat> what you're showing here is a map of the waves. So you can see those big red pulses are big, big storms that came through while we were there. So we were measuring every, you know, gas transfer, wind speed, and waves, which is typically not done or not, not as often. 
And what we found was that if we look at, we measured all these, the same relationships that we've seen before with different, using different gases and different cruises. Um, so this is the transfer velocity against the wind speed. And if we use another, another kind of idea, which is the waves are what's driving the transfer, meaning the wind drives the waves, but the waves kind of get more at what the, the processes that are important. So the waves generate turbulence and they also generate bubbles. So it's kind of accounting for multiple processes in one. And if we make a relationship, a simple relationship of a Reynolds number here, which is a relationship between a velocity <clears throat> and a wave height scale um, divided by its viscosity, so how much viscous forces are impacted by inertial forces, we see that the transfer velocity scales really nicely with this Reynolds number based on the waves. So we're able to collapse the data and we've, you know, provided a better constraint on the estimate of uptake by the ocean. So what else do we care about the surface of the ocean? 80% <clears throat> of the solar radiation that's incident on the ocean surface is absorbed in that same 10 meters. So a lot of the heat is absorbed and stored in the ocean is very close to the surface. And why do we care about these two things now, the gas trans, the flux of CO2, how much uptake by the ocean and how much heat is absorbed by the atmosphere, uh, by the ocean. <clears throat> and it, it all kind of ties together with the idea of a greenhouse effect. I'm sure you're all aware of this. Greenhouse gases, the trap heat in the earth's surface as from keep preventing it from escaping. So when the sun is allowed to penetrate through the atmosphere, it's absorbed by the by the earth's surface and then that heat is re-radiated back, but it's it's because it's re-radiated at a different wavelength or different in long wave, it's trapped in the atmosphere because the atmosphere absorbs it. So the solar radiation can penetrate, but the re-emitted radiation gets trapped because it's absorbed. And why it's absorbed is because of CO2, methane, and other gases. And a very important gas is water vapor. <clears throat> the ocean, so... Heat absorbed by the oceans, compared to all these other places, heat absorbed by the atmosphere, um, heat required to melt northern, the whole northern hemisphere of sea ice, Heat required to melt the glaciers. Um, heat required to the continental glaciers, not the mountain glaciers, and, and the continental glaciers, and the heat that's absorbed by the continents. All these values are, are reasonably small compared to how much heat is absorbed by the ocean. So it's an incredible sink of heat. Now, on top of that, we have 90 to 96 percent of the primary product productivity of the ocean occurs in the upper 10 meters as well. So primary production, algae, you know, little green, green critters, green stuff, is the first link in the food chain. And 99% of the earth, earth living space is in the oceans. So why do I bring up primary production? Because, uh, so, oh, again, so the first two and a half meters of the ocean have the same heat capacity as the dry atmosphere above. So it takes the same amount of energy to warm this two and a half meters as the entire atmosphere by one and a half degrees, by one degree Fahrenheit. So what's driving the, these processes? One, the sun is driving, is the pipeline. Some of it's radiated back, some of it gets absorbed in the ocean. We'll think of the ocean as the fuel tank, which drives exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere. This exchange of moisture and the exchange of heat. So you can generate moist, warm, moist air, and that generates the wind, and that's your engine, and that generates the waves and currents, which then mix the ocean. So 
So this is this circle here is what I study. Yeah, go ahead. Um, printer friendly like PDFs of these charts because I would love to use in my classroom. Totally, yeah, I can totally share my my P, my um, PowerPoint with you. Okay. And we're also going to have this recording on the website. Okay, yeah, I just I love these and I've been trying to like sketch them out. I would want them as PDFs almost. Yeah. I can totally. I, yes, I'm happy to share that stuff. So I study this area in this in this kind of pink circle and a little more detail on that. I mentioned so once the once we once we say kind of the energy this the ocean warms up, how does that heat get moved around? Well, we, we have these fancy we have these th terms called production, buoyancy, and dissipation. And um and what they really mean are production is you have surface currents that move move the move the water around and the gradient of that of those currents generate little eddies and those eddies move mix mix the water then you have buoyancy which is the the um how do you want to say this the the change in density of the of the ocean of an ocean particle when it becomes denser it sinks and the lighter ones move up to the surface so when you have heating at the surface changes in the fresh water coming in you get this overturning because of buoyancy because of the you know the density of the water it changes and then you have finally have this kind of dissipation which is this turbulence is generated then gets dissipated at really small scales so this is kind of how the mixed when we say mixed layer turbulence, this is what is really driving it. So throughout my <clears throat> throughout my career, I've done a lot of different used a lot of different platforms to measure all these processes. Whether it's from a mooring here, um, using drifters and spar buoys like this, which drift around, measure all those the turbulent fluxes, the momentum, and temperature and water vapor. You have these surface platforms here that measure the near surface uh, temperature here and here, all these, these measurements here of temperature and salinity. And we also sit on man, um, manned stable platforms. This is flip and put instruments out on these booms, put instruments in the water. And we also do obviously tons of work from ships. But most of the time we go out when you do these things, it's over a very short period of time. Excuse yeah. me, Chris. Is yeah. Flip still in use? Flip is about to be retired, very sadly. It's about 70 years old or something. 1960. So, 60, yeah, 60 years old, yes. And I I've been on it seven or eight times. It's a great platform. Yeah, it's a ship that uh, when it gets to position, takes water into its ballast tanks and <clears throat> it goes from horizontal to vertical. Right. So this picture here shows just the top half, but there's about another two thirds of this column right here that sinks way down below the ocean. And that's what, what Michael's talking about. It gets filled up. So when we go out there, it's horizontal. And this is the front of the ship up here when it's horizontal. And you get towed out to where you want to flip and literally just kind of teeters back. Boom. And you, it's kind of, it's kind of a, an amazing experience. We'll give it that. I understand it's extremely stable when it's in position. Amazing stable, amazingly stable. So you can, <clears throat> it's almost, it's good for certain wavelengths. I mean, certain waves. I mean, I've been on, I've been on flip when waves have come up to right at that first deck. And it's not really, it's not really a great thing to be on there when it's the waves are coming up that high. Cause then it does feel like you're being tossed around. Um, actually we had, I had to, one time I had to abandon flip because it was too dangerous, but it's a story for another day. <laughs> so one thing we've been moving to is more kind of long-term duration experiments where we can put our instruments, our same instruments we've always used from ships and 
drifters and flip, we can put them on these towers over on the ocean. We can measure these same fluxes from here, measure the same um, uh, properties in the water, in the ocean. We can also put great imaging systems. So here is, this isn't just a, a video image. This is actually an, an image of the ocean's slope. So it's, it's the wave height of the ocean um, measured just from using um, a polarimetric camera. And we can uh, we've had it on this tower for about five, six months, right before COVID, and then we retrieved it. Right, right before COVID, we retrieved it, and we're we're still looking at this this wealth of information. But what we really want to get to is what we what we've been moving towards. In addition to all these these similar prop these similar measurements. I mean, when you think about this one, this is in, in a station, this is in a single point, you know, right in one spot in the ocean in the mooring or on flip, or even this drifter is kind of a single spot in these, in these drifters here, or even a ship. And gliders, which are underwater vehicles, whether it's a glider or autonomous vehicles that have propulsion, they've been around for 20 years now and or 30 years since I was a grad student. And they, they provide a, a wealth of information in terms of spatial characteristics of the ocean, not just sitting in one spot, but kind of driving through. They drive very slowly, but they really map out an, um, a nice um, context of what the ocean, what's happening in the ocean. And they're a mainstay now. Everyone, everyone has a glider or multiple gliders, fleets of gliders. But UAVs or drones are much earlier or in their infancy in terms of being used for oceanography or even atmospheric science. <clears throat> and I don't, when I when I'm when I talk about a drone, I talk about more like a fixed a larger fixed wing aircraft. Not quite this this drone here, but I'll I'll show you what we are, we're using now. But this these UAVs allow us to do to do some really really broaden the scope of the science that we can do. So I mentioned all those things, the, the carbon cycle, um, ocean heating, <clears throat> primary production in the near surface ocean. And we wanted to look at all, all, all of that in a location. And we decided to go to Fiji. And this is a map of ocean temperature. You can see it's a very warm area, warm ocean. And we wanted to really understand why it's such a warm ocean. <clears throat> so we went out on the Falcor in right before COVID as well, in November, December, 2019. And the Falcor is the, the, Sch the Schmidt Ocean Institute research vessel. They're actually building a new uh, next generation Falcor. I don't know what the name of it is yet, but it's supposed to be even fancier than the original. Um, so here's Fiji. We had to get clearances to go throughout this whole area. Not just Fiji, but the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Tonga, Wallace and Fortuna, and Tuvalu. This whole area we wanted to map out. And here's a video I wanted to show you. Why do we study the ocean? put it simply because the ocean drives you our hear climate. That? This is a story of discovery of how we observe the ocean from large scales to small scales, from coarse satellite imagery to ultra high resolution surface maps. Our team from Columbia University is here aboard the RV Falcor to understand how the ocean is changing on a multitude of spatial and temporal scales to observe how the ocean's ecosystem adapts and survives in a changing climate. The ocean is a very dynamic environment and our method for making measurements needs to be equally dynamic to react at a moment's notice. The air to sea story starts and ends with a map. From a low resolution satellite map with a scale of hundreds of kilometers to a high resolution map of microturbulence with a scale of millimeters. 
What's really exciting is how we get from one to the other. This is when the UAVs come into play. Deploying these autonomous aircraft, each equipped with specialized sensors and equipment, we're able to map a very large area efficiently and with considerably greater resolution than the satellite imagery. A few days ago, we crossed over a very large pumice patch and it was about 10 miles from the ship. Uh, we decided it was interesting enough to go send everything over there. So we picked up all of the other scientific equipment, SPIP and Sniffle and the catamaran, and we hightailed it over to the pumice patch where everything got thrown back in the water and we were able to map that out from the air while the, all the other scientific equipment on the ship and, and floating around the ship were able to... Oops. ...capture that data as well. You wouldn't have never known that patch was just 10 miles away um, and a valuable scientific target. Thanks to our ability to act dynamically using real-time data, we tracked down pumice, which was likely to be the remnants of an underwater eruption near Tonga in August of 2019. The data we collect at times like this, such as thermal imaging and hyperspectral color imagery shown here, allows us to understand the effect of surface material, in this case the pumice, on sea surface temperature. Hi, my name is Anna, and this is our infrared radiometer. It's one of the instruments we have mounted on the ship, and it gives us very high resolution imagery of the sea surface temperature. So on the computer, we're able to see a three by three meter field of view of the sea surface temperature. And in that view, you can see all sorts of processes happening, um, convection cells bringing relatively warm subsurface water uh, and disrupting the cool skin, uh, eddies, uh, waves breaking, sea foam. Um, they all have different temperature signals. That's all very clear in IR imagery. Altogether, this data helps us build up a transformational view of the sea surface microlayer in groundbreaking detail, one which will eventually allow us to understand how the ocean and the atmosphere interact and how the ocean's ecosystem adapts and survives in a changing climate. Okay, so I see there's a question about have material data on coral bleaching in that area? No, I do not. <clears throat> we did we did take samples of. I think in that in that video, we I mentioned we mentioned that um, we were there right when there was a. Another Tongan, um, under underwater volcano, that we picked up some pumice from. So we've had we picked up some pumice from that area. From an underwater underwater volcano, so have samples. What altitude does the drone fly? So, we <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, we fly depending on what we're trying to measure. So, if we're trying to measure the those turbulent fluxes of of temp, of sensible heat and evaporation and momentum, we want to fly as close to the surface as possible. So. We typically fly about 100 feet off the ocean, so about 30 meters. So it's very, um, very close. Other times when we want to measure, do mapping of temperature or um, the um, ocean color, we want to fly at at least, say, 1,500 meters. Um, and when we want to measure, say, the incoming solar radiation that we talked, you know, what I mentioned earlier, we want to fly it around um, somewhere in between those two. So it really depends on what payload we're going to um, fly, and I'll mention that. I'll talk a little bit more now about, about um, the UAVs and the payloads that we fly just coming up here. Okay. So, here's so here's our here's um, Fiji, and here's our cruise track. We kind of went up, kind of north east of Fiji, then went to kind of south, went over to the over towards Tonga a little bit to the volcano, and then headed back all the way back towards uh, Fiji. So what we were very interested in 
looking at here is trichodismium. Um, this is a cyanobacteria, and it's um, very pronounced in this region. But it's it's not only is it a well, it's important. Well, this is what it looks like. A um, on the right under a microscope. And the importance here is that m many times it's kind of sits right at the surface. So this is um, in areas where it's, um, you can actually see a, a, a smooth surface. This is just measured anywhere in the ocean, but it's right at the surface in the top millimeter. And this is how much you see in the bulk of the ocean in around one meter deep. That's what Ajit was doing? Um, no, I, this is what Oliver Whirl was measuring this. Oliver had the catamaran. Ajit was measuring, um, you don't know if he got any samples, but Ajit was measuring um, the radiometric properties from the ship of the, of the cyanobacteria. And he may have gotten some samples, but most of the samples were Oliver Whirl and his catamaran. So why do we care? Why do we? This 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 is um to give a little sense of how how expansive and how 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 much coverage there is of the of these cyanobacteria bacteria blooms, and you can see here these kind of sinew sinewy wherever there's green versus the blue is cyanobacteria off the coast here of. This is off the coast of um, Australia, but it's very similar kind of imagery off of, of Fiji and further offshore. But this is a Landsat image on the left. <clears throat> and then this is a estimate of what the chlorophyll is. And one thing you'll notice is that there's lots of white, which is, means there's, there were clouds in the area and they couldn't determine exactly what the ocean, um, what the cyanobacteria concentration was or the chlorophyll concentration was. But you also see here that there is significant concentration of chlorophyll that maps matches up with these regions over here. So we want to use these drones to for a number of things. It allows us to expand the purview of the of the ship, meaning we can not just sit at one spot, but we can map out significant distances. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about these these UAVs that we were using. <clears throat> the um, basically has um we can fly for sixty nautical miles away from the ship, and we can fly for up to a maximum endurance of twenty hours, but that's without a payload. So for the payloads, we could fly up to about twelve hours, just nonstop flying. And we fly roughly at um, 40 knots, 50 knots is how fast the aircraft fly. And the payloads we usually have are about 12 to 15 pounds. I don't have a 20 pound payload yet. Um, some important things that our limitation is this wind, the launch, wind and wind, the launch and recovery wind limitation is about 30 to 30 knots. We've flown in maybe, maybe yeah, 15 meter per second winds. Um, that's our main constraint. And that's mainly because when you take off from a ship, when you're, you pass through a boundary layer and it kind of can really jar the plane very quickly. And it can't really handle that well. Chris, could you mention briefly how the UAVs are constructed? Ooh, I mean, it's a carbon fiber. Um, yeah, not something you can go into Walmart and get. No, it's an extruded carbon fiber um, system, and it's, um, it's they're very expensive. <laughs> the, um, I, I think I, I have one on order right now, and it's been like seven, eight months for them to build it, uh, just because it's all the all the detail that they have to take, and it's not just the extruded extruded material in all these formed pieces but also the all the electronics inside uh, and the um, integration of the two types of systems so you notice that it 
at a vertical takeoff, which I'm talking about here, vertical takeoff is by these vertical propellers and those are all battery driven. And then it switches to the, to the wing, to the fixed wing flight with this rear propeller, which is fuel driven. Um, one thing that's really nice about these is that it's fully autonomous takeoff and landing. So you just say take off and land, even though the ship is heaving and moving, it, it has a, we have a Jeep, dual GPS on the aircraft and then a GPS on the ground station on the ship. So they're all kind of in tandem. They, they, they know they're all kind of know how much the ship is moving up and down so that it can adjust for any kind of motion of the ship as it takes off. And the same thing when it lands. I found a video with, I think it's Ryan Harris. Yes. Putting talk, one so together, Lamont. He's talking about all the UA, the, the payloads, right? He's talking about creating the different parts to it, which are yep. interchangeable. That's on the Earth to Class website, everyone. Cool. I have a so question, what's thing? in the payload? Yes, what's in the payload, yep. And I'll get to, I'll get to that here in a little bit. The um, so that's one thing we can do is it has autonomous takeoff and landing, and then we can have dual or multi multi aircraft flight operations. So almost every every time we flew on the cruise, we had at least two aircraft in the airplane. So this gets to the question about what altitude do they fly? We typically have one that was flying really low to measure the various fluxes out of the ocean. And we usually had another one that was flying much higher to look at the map, to map out whether it was ocean color or ocean temperature. Um, and the, one of the most exciting things is it has this long range capability of 50 nautical miles, which is what it can fly anyway. But the, the amazing or the thing that we really um, needed or can really take advantage of is this high bandwidth data link, meaning we can get all the data back real time. We can see and react real time to what we're seeing. So we can have real time mission control and tasking. So if you're on a ship and you can think about all those drifters, they're just sitting there waiting for something to happen. We're on a ship, you're waiting for something to happen. The beauty of this is that you t send out your aircraft, you go, we're able to go and map out a significant area really far away from the ship that satellites, we only get satellites every, every couple days. So we really don't know. And it's not really high resolution enough. So we go out and we fly the UAVs. And then we, when we find the, the, in this case, the cyanobacteria bloom that we want to measure, we take everything out of the water. We steam over to where the aircraft found the, the bloom, put all the instruments back in the water and just sample there for you know, days upon days, and then keep flying with the UAVs. The So it's a much more efficient way of doing science, that we're not just waiting there, hoping we see something. We're going and actively, at a much more efficient way, actively looking for the processes we're trying to study. Um, another thing about this long-range data link is that we could have multiple aircrafts that could go daisy chain even further away from the ship. So each one has a 50 nautical mile rain, um, data link on it. So if you have a second one, you can go even further away from the ship, up to around 100, 100 nautical miles. And you can even have, um, you know, a full squadron of these UAVs, depending on how many we have. We had three when we were out there. So Michael mentioned uh, payloads. And our approach to doing payloads is we have this kind of base unit, which has all of the computer, the acquisition system, the um, GPS, uh, the navigation system, and then some simple instruments we want on every single um, flight, which is sea surface temperature, which is this red one here, and humidity and temperature of the, and, and pressure of the atmosphere. But then for every, so then you see all this empty space here and here's where we can put all the different um, sensors that we want that are specialized for specific science. 
So in this case, I'm just showing um, what we call on pyranometers and pergeometers. These measure the long wave and short wave radiation from the ocean and the atmosphere. So the downwelling solar and the, what's reflected by the ocean. And we also have a camera here that tells us what the, what the ocean is look, look, looks like when we're actually measuring these properties. So that's just one payload that we can swap in into this base payload. And we have a whole number of these. And we took four, four specific ones we used out on the on this cruise, which was this one that says visible thermal infrared. So we had a visible camera, a thermal infrared camera, and a, and a laser LIDAR to measure the waves on one of the payloads. We had this hyperspectral VNIR, and this measures the ocean color. So it's measuring the cyanobacteria of the ocean. We have this one here called the LIMET, which is a, again, has a LIDAR on it, but also measures all the turbulent fluxes of momentum, sensible heat, and uh, evaporative heat, light, latent heat. And then finally, this last one that I just mentioned, we call it the RAD payload, which is, it measures the solar incoming solar radiation and the long wave radiation. Chris, you might need to explain LIDAR to some people. Oh, LIDAR. LIDAR is light emitting, <laughs> it's a way of measuring, in this case, we're measuring the range to a surface using a laser. So it's a very, not a high powered laser at all, um, with a laser diode that measures the range to a surface. So it looks at the time of flight of the, the light pulse when it comes back to the surface, to, to, that's reflected back. So we can use that to measure altitude of the ship, of the aircraft, but also it tells us what the, uh, what the waves are doing. So some of the things we accomplished during this, this cruise, before we get to all the science we did, we had our, this, so this, this autonomous takeoff and landing was actually pretty, um, was, was all these things were very new um, and were all successful. Um, so we had this autonomous takeoff, we had the dual aircraft flights, we flew for 242 hours when we were out there, um, basically eight hours, at least eight to 12 hours every day. And we were able to do this long range um, capability with the high bandwidth data link for real time mission control and tasking, which was really, allows us to do much more efficient science and have more productive crews. So where are we? Okay. so. Oh, did I answer your question, Richard? What is in the payload? Uh, yes, great, thank you. Oh, okay, okay, good. I just saw your question, I didn't know if I yeah. had. So now we have these great, we have these payloads, what can we use them for? Um, so well, one, one, one important thing is that the, the UAVs, because they're autonomous and we can just, we can, program them to fly wherever we want them to fly, we're able to look do steady, repeatable tracks over the same location. So at different times, this isn't from this cruise, it's a demonstration from somewhere else, but you can see that we, we're, we can fly over three different days when you have very different wind conditions and atmospheric conditions. We're, we're able to program it and it could fly within a meter of where we were the, just a few days earlier or, within, or a week earlier. So it's being able to go over the same spot every time and very, very precisely is, is really powerful, especially over the ocean when it all looks the same out there. <laughs> there's no land, so there's no reference except for the stars. Um, and the other thing is that unlike on a ship, which is bouncing around with the waves on a aircraft, there's low levels of vibration. So it's really ideal for making turbulence measurements to measure the momentum flux, the sensible flux, the latent heat fluxes um, from the ocean to the atmosphere. Um, and also the low profile aircraft itself allows for very clean radiometric measurements. Typically on a ship, usually the, the radiometers aren't the highest point on the ship. 
So they're measuring some of the superstructure of the ship in general. So this, in general, the UAV allows us to get away from the superstructure of the ship and all, the, all its contamination to get really clean, precise measurements of the ocean and the atmosphere. So I mentioned there's the base payload and where it sits on the aircraft. And then these are the four that I mentioned that we had out there. So the thermal and visible cameras, the radiometers, the long wave and short wave radiometers, the hyperspectral imager that's going to measure the ocean color and the cyanobacteria, and then the one that measures the air sea fluxes. So we're uh, a course of a day. We put our drifters in the our drifter in the water here. We put the catamaran in the water. We start sampling. We take off with the UAV. There's a little one of our that's called SPIP um, surface in, surface processes instrument platform, um, and it's just kind of sitting there in the water doing its thing. And then we fly overhead with the UAV. Um, here's mission control inside the inside the ship. So mission control for the UAV. So it has picture, you know, a video of the flight deck, video of from the aircraft looking down. Here's the flight tracks the pilots are using the flight tracks here to program where the flight where the aircraft is going. Um, over here, some real time data actually coming back here and here. Um, so all this is on, is we're all, we're all working in tandem to fly the aircraft, look at the data and then reposition where we want the aircraft to go, depending on what we see that comes back. So here's a shot from the, from the UAV. It's flying around the ship. You can see the beautifully calm water. This isn't typically my typical cruise. I kind of go both areas where it's very calm like this when we're studying processes like cyanobacteria and its impact on the heat budget uptake from the from the solar radiation. Other times I go to places like Greenland where it was really rip roaring and this would just be covered with big waves and foam and you wouldn't be there wouldn't be any sun and it would be cloudy and overcast the whole time. So it's very different parts of the the globe that I, I like to um, study these processes. So we're flying around with the UAV looking for cyanobacteria. So we find the cyanobacteria and then we take everything out of the water and then go to where the cyanobacteria is, where the UAV found it, put everything back in the water. So here you can see the cyanobacteria in the water, put the spit right in, right in there. And this is what that, the cyanobacteria bloom that we found, what it looks like. So here's the ship. Here's Spip here. Here's um, that's not the catamaran. That's the boat, the ship, the work boat from the ship. Um, and then the catamaran must be behind us, back this off the screen. But you see this very sinewy sign of bacteria bloom, and you can see this front, the whole you know, off in the distance. And it's when we map it out, it's it's just expansive. And I think I have that next. Yes. So this is now the UAV that's mapping out this long sinewy patch. And what we see is there's, there's multiple, these long sinewy patches and they're like little multiple fronts and they kind of extend beyond back behind. And here's another one up here, multiple fronts of this cyanobacteria. And this is, this is the ocean color map. And then on the right here is the, um, temperature this, this ocean temperature map that corresponds directly with the cyanobacteria here along these fronts here and here and similarly up here you can see multiple those same same multiple fronts that you see on the in the ocean color of the cyanobacteria you definitely see the the enhanced temperature the warmer temperature that corresponds to those um, cyanobacteria so we want to study why the cyanobacteria looks warmer um, 
or why why is it why is it warmer is there a question no so this is a this is some data from looking at trichodesmium cyanobacteria so on the top is kind of the abundance we'll just call it the abundance of of trichodesmium and you can see it goes up by this you know our measurement of of the drifter it kind of goes up over time similarly on the bottom is the temperature of the ocean in the same from the same drifter and you can see that as the just as the trichodesmium goes up over time the temperature of the ocean goes up over time but our model which is the lighter orange here so the dark orange is the real temperature that we measure and this light orange is the temperature that a model would tell us and you can see that the model significantly underestimates how much warming there is in the ocean in the presence of this cyanobacteria so we want to build a better model the other thing that was important is that not only does the so that was right at the surface the previous slide over here on the right here this is both at the surface and at depth so while both the surface and at depth were warming and and the model underestimates both at the surface and at like a meter depth so as i was mentioned earlier about how much where the solar radiation is being absorbed in the top 10 meters this is showing that the the warming the models underestimate this warming both at the surface right at the surface and even at a, at a meter below so again we have this warming from above from the solar and then all these processes these different processes that i mentioned are what are mixing it up so if you have something that's keeping that warm layer really shallow near the surface, then this, then the, then these turbulent processes really can't mix it up as, as efficiently. So this, forget about the equations here. <laughs> oh, have we had similar studies in Arctic and the Indian Ocean? So we did a similar heat budget in the Arctic up in Kotzebue and I mentioned that I did talk about that last year I can touch on that again at the end here and in the Indian Ocean we studied um, we did study the Matt and Julian oscillation and we did look at the heat we did the team looked at the heat budget of the in the Indian Ocean due to um, but it wasn't due to um, any cyanobacteria those are just near surface ocean heat budgets. And <clears throat> in this case, we want to understand how cyanobacteria is impacting the heat budget. Um, so what is the heat budget? So like I said, forget the equations and we'll just look at the, the text that I wrote down below. But in general, you basically want to average or you're looking at the temperature in the surface. So in that, whatever layer we decide. So whether it's down to 10 meters, down to five meters, down to two meters, one meters, we're going to average the temperature in the near surface ocean and look at how that changes over time. Okay. And then everything on, so that's, that's what we're measuring and see, seeing what how it changes over time. And everything on the right hand side here is what impacts that change in temperature. So the first thing we want to measure, that we is the easiest thing to measure are the surface fluxes and that's what people typically measure from a ship and you can measure from a mooring and a buoy and we measure from the aircraft as well and the surface fluxes are the sensible and the latent heat turbulent heat fluxes the second term here is just how the currents there's the currents move heat around the third one is how those eddies, those turbulent eddies that we were talking about, how those move the heat around, how they transport heat. And then the third one, or the, 
the fourth one, sorry, the fourth one, is how heat moves across the bottom of our layer that we're averaging. So at the base of that layer where it's warming, how does heat get across that? Or how fast does it get across there? Um, and then finally, how much of the solar radiation gets across this bottom layer as well. So from our little, both the combination of the UAV and our drifter, the drifter kind of gives us a con and context in a high resolution at a point, and then the UAV gives us kind of the horizontal context of what the impact is of this in the whole region. <laughs> that was, I forgot that one. So this box, this box is typically, no one usually measures this box. People just usually measure the change in temperature, the surface fluxes, and how things get moved around. The beauty of what we're doing now is we're able to do all of this on the right because we have the UAV and this drifter and some other measurements that we're going to um, do something, some new things with. So putting it all together, we have the ship, UAV goes up, flies around, makes all the measurements that we just discussed. We have the catamaran, it's doing the surface sampling. We have our SPIP that measures all the near surface processes in the ocean. We also have a direct covariance on the ship to match up with the UAV. Another, we have also another LiDAR on the ship to measure the waves, just like we have on the UAV. And the thing I haven't mentioned yet was this, we have an infrared camera on the ship and that gets it one, that gets it one of those pieces in the box of the, of the measurements. And we also have hemispheric radiometers up here to compare with what we measure from the ship, from the aircraft. And then there's two CTDs that measure temperature and salinity of the ocean um, below the layer we're looking at. And then the spectroradiometer measures how much solar radiation gets below the, the layer we're measuring. And then satellites give the whole, gives, add some context. But as I said, we only see satellites every few days. So these are some measurements. This is what typical data looks like. It's very repeatable. There's, it's, um, here's, it's very low winds. Here it's always below 10 meters per second. Sometimes it went up a little higher, okay. The temp air temperature was right in the, right around 26 to 30 degrees Celsius. And the humidity of anywhere in the ocean is around 80%. If it gets down to 60, that's pretty dry for the ocean. Typically you're right around 80% of relative humidity on the ocean. And with high temperatures and high, humi and high relative humidity, that's very moist air. So think about today when it's cold out here in, in the city, you could have 80% humidity, but it's still going to feel dry because it's cold because the air can't hold much temperature when uh, can't hold much humidity when it's, when it's cold out. Typical salinities here, the salinities are around 30 PSU. Do I have that? Where is that? Let me go back. Ah, uh, I just put the Delta PSU. Bummer. Around 30 here. That's fresh in. Sorry, what? That's fresh in we have around here. Well, it's right? well, it's it's definitely over 30. I and I need to double check that. It's over 30 for sure. And yeah, I think we have about 34 here. Yeah. 
it, typically the ocean's around 35, but near coastal areas, it could get, it, it changes a lot. It's more, much more variable, but on the, op typically in the open ocean, it's around 35 PSU. So the, the short wave is, this, is this, is this, is the, um, solar radiation is, as you can see, it just has this diurnal cycle and it's, it was a lot, you know, when, where we were, a thousand watts per meter squared is a is a high, is a strong sun. So we didn't want to spend much time out in the sun. The here are the measurements of the direct the sensible heat flux and the latent heat flux. You can see this is typical over the ocean as well. The sensible heat flux is much lower than the latent heat flux, so evaporation is much more important over the ocean than the sensible heat flux typically. Um, you can get really strong sensible heat fluxes when you have a cold air outbreak near land. So when you have a warm ocean and you have cold air coming, ripping off the continent, you can get really strong sensible heat fluxes. But typically in non, you know, extreme areas, the sensible heat flux is typically lower than the latent heat flux. Um, and then down here is when we see all these times here are when we actually see cyanobacteria blooms, all these green dots. And there's a lot, well, large variation in the concentration of the, of these um, blooms. So our goal uh, was to be able to not just, in this case, look and see where the, the direct covariance fluxes, so the, these fluxes of heat diverge from the models, but also quantify the spatial variability of the, uh, the how much solar radiation is absorbed by the ocean. And we think, you know, it should be correlated with when we see blooms. So this is looking at that same model that I mentioned earlier about for when we saw the cyanobacteria blooms before and we saw that the, the ocean warmed up more than the than the model predicted. Here is the here's that same kind of um, model. The model is in orange here and you can see that our measurements from our SPIP buoy are always measuring something that's much even more much warmer than what the model shows and similarly over here and in the third case here as well and this is kind of what this the near surface ocean structure looks like here's the surface at the top and here is a half meter a meter and a meter and a half below the surface. And the color code is temperature. So you can see here, before the sun comes up, you can see the temperature of the ocean is around 30 degrees. And by midday, it's up around 34 degrees. So it's, it's, it's warmed up by a good four degrees Celsius in the course of the day. But you'll notice that it, it warms up very near the surface. Remember in the beginning I mentioned that the solar radiation is absorbed in the top 10 meters. Here we're seeing a lot of warming is happening right here within the top meter, half meter and a meter. And then over time, eventually it mixes by those processes we talked about earlier. Those, the, the surface currents, um, the gradient in the surface currents and the buoyancy impacts of this. Because if it's warming, it's getting lighter and then it, um, so it's going to become more stable. So buoyancy is acting against that mixing. So that means that the currents are really, str are really strong here to mix this, to be able to mix this down. So why do we see this temperature so close to the surface? Well, what we have measurements of is how much 
how much um, solar radiation is, is absorbed right at the surface, and then how much is absorbed just below the layer we're looking at. And what we see is that the downwelling radiative flux increases with increasing cyanobacteria concentration. So the more cyanobacteria there is, the more um, radiation is absorbed near the surface. So that's why we see this really strong warming at the surface, right at the surface. Amanda, is there a section of this that shows the impact of storm cyclones? How long does it take for bacteria to come back? We do not. We were not there during a storm. Do I have other other examples of that somewhere else? That second question. These are all really good questions. I don't have in this in this study. We don't have that information. So. Right. So now that we have all those measurements and we have this map of of temperature. So this was a this is at one location, right? A single location that shows in the cyanobacteria what happens. Now we can expand that and remember this map here of the cyanobacteria we can get a concentration of cyanobacteria from these, this ocean color measurement and our estimates of the surface temperature to see how um, what we're measuring in, in one location expands to other locations. So that's, that's, Okay, so that's kind of where that's where we're at with the um, with this. I have a student who is really who's focusing on this whole the heat budget and how we're gonna and especially these in all the measuring all these terms and to close that budget and then expand this to more regional the regional impact um, on climate or in this case in, around Fiji. One other thing we, we found when we were there was in this, this is, gets, I don't know if this gets at the coral question, but we did measure, we actually sampled pumice from the Tongan um, underwater volcano. And this is the, so the lower panel again, this is the um, ocean color. So it's not, this isn't cyanobacteria. This is obviously clearly a different color. This is the pumice, pumice here, and you see all this pumice along here. This is a nice blue ocean over here, but you clearly see this pumice is actually absorbing a lot of the solar radiation right at the surface here and here throughout that matches up perfectly, perfectly with the pumice we see in the um, ocean color measurements. And this is um, a Jeet and a co-author and I, or a number of co-authors, including Jeet and myself, are putting together a paper on this. So this is, you know, going to see, oh, what's going on? So the, the I'm not a I'm not a biologist, but the any kind of material that's in the in the surface layer, whether it's um, trichodesmium or cyanobacteria or, or algae, um, they're all going to they're all going to absorb um, solar radiation. So, depending on solar radiation, is impacted by the clarity of the water in general, and if you have, whether it's um, organisms or particulates or whatever, they're all going to absorb radiation. 
the relative amounts of absorption. I don't know why, I don't know which ones absorb more than the other. Um, and that's where Ajit comes in. He's going to be the one that tells us why trichotismia absorbs more than, or is, is absorbing how much it does. But we, we should be able to look at how the clarity of the water, when there is cyanobacteria and when there isn't, to see how much radiation is absorbed. It should tell us something about other, loca other locations where we've absorbed, um, where we've observed trichotismian blooms and, and Ajit's been measuring using the same spectral radiometer in other locations. So Ajit has, when I say Ajit, he has those measurements that he, he can probably provide better information on. Um, the, the root cause of why trichotismium absorbs. But in we'll get general, him for it's because it's Earth class. Sorry, what? We'll get him for a future Earth to class. He, he probably talked about it already in his other one a little bit, right? He has talked about trichotismium in other talks. So, um, yes, yeah, so I don't have more information on that, Richard. But the, 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 the main point is that particulate in general is absorbs more radiation near the surface. And if it's near the surface, that heat stays at the surface. Right, so that's that's where I was for there. I can stop there or I can make links I could make some links to 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 Kotzebue. Because the the temperature of the ocean here Remember I mentioned, I showed that the, that map of temperature, how it's very warm right here. Well, that temperature or that, that part, this part of the ocean has a very circuitous route. So let's map, let's map that out. So here's Fiji. Here's this region right here. If we go to the, this is a map of ocean surface currents, right? So we're talking about Fiji right around here. So this. Pacific South Equatorial Current takes that warm water, kind of crosses over the equator. It kind of gets goes all the way back across the Pacific Equatorial Contra Current, comes up. It goes back across the Pacific North Equatorial Current and then up the Curcio, which is very, it's basically the Gulf Stream of the Asian coast. And the Curcio takes it up to the North Pacific Current. And then it meets up with, it could either go south down the California current, but it can go up the Alaska, um, Alaskan current and up through the Bering, Bering current, and then eventually makes its way into Kotzebue, <laughs> which is what I talked about last time. And I mentioned that Kotzebue, where we also used UAVs, has been showing lots of sea ice or in general the arctic has had a lot of sea ice change and has lots of consequences for the sea ice change on the community in general and it's threatening a way of life up there and i think last time i, I spoke about this um a lot i just wanted to tie in how much time do i have about 10 minutes 10 minutes okay so for those who didn't hear this last time, this project was um, about a community-based approach to research design and, and, use, and valuing indigenous partnerships, and specifically to highlight answers to community-driven research questions. Um, so it was a com community-based research design. It begins with community engagement. Um, we engage before we even define the research questions and we, and we work with an indigenous advisory council to develop those questions. This was the team, myself, Ajit again, same guy, same cast of characters, Postdoc and Carson. And there was a whole team from Alaska Fairbanks who looked at sea ice. Um, we had a videographer who documented the whole thing. We had a person, um, Alex, who was our, our liaison with the community, and Jessica was a master's student or PhD student now looking at marine mammals. 
and this is our advisory council. So that warm water comes up the coast. This is what the this is what the what the what Constable looks like typically. It's usually covered in in ice all the way to April, and the ice comes out to right around here, the beginning of the opening of the sound typically. Okay, now the years we were up there, that same time of year, the sound was open, so it was, there were two really large anomalous years, that year in 2019, and what. we learned was that water that comes up the coastal current comes into the, some of it comes into the sound. So that warm water, you can see the warm water all along the coast here, and some of it actually empties into the sound. And so here's the, here's the sound, here's what it typically looks like with the, the uh, uh, sea ice. And we want to study we were studying this spring melt. So when did, why, what's, what's driving the melt? Again, here's the, why do we care about this? The melt is because marine, in terms of the hunt, the marine mammals um, use the sea ice. Um, so there's great interest in understanding why, when the, when the sea ice is gonna break up so that, cause that will impact when the um, community can go out for their um, marine mammal hunts. Um, but it required sea ice mass balance, momentum balance, and it requires local measurements of the sea ice. So that Alaskan coastal current comes in. If it's warmer, it's going to add more warming or warm water to the sound that may contribute to the breakup. But one thing we learned is that's very important are the rivers. The rivers also are very important. So here's this river channel here you can see. Well, I'm beneath the sea ice. So the ocean's important, the river's important, and the atmospheric is, atmosphere is important. <clears throat> so last time I, I talked about was how in the fall, the salinity and temperature are um, in the same direction. And in the spring, the salinity, when the salinity decreases, the temperature increases. So the rivers exert a primary control over the formation and breakup of the land fast ice near Kotzebue. So the upstream temperatures in the rivers up here are a useful tool for anticipating both freeze up and break up. And this is kind of a summary of what happens. The, when, that warm, when that warm salty water, ocean water comes up in the fall and the winter um, is further from the freezing point the river is actually colder and closer to the freezing point. So the ocean, this river water that's pushing against the ocean water is, a, is keeping, allowing the ice to, to freeze. But in these years when it was really thin, this, this water was much warmer than, typ than typical. So it wasn't able to grow as much as, tip as it usually does. Oops. And then similarly in the spring, the the warmer the river water is much warmer and further from freezing than the ocean and so it's actually the river that then then drives the melt in the in the in the, uh, in the spring so this balance with this this kind of push pull between the ocean and the river is is both um, growing and diminishing the ice in the fall and also and then driving the breakup in the spring I think I showed this last time. But for the UAVs, because the, the um, we're, we're studying the melt when you don't want to go out on the ice because it's not safe, the UAVs are, are really important to, un to, to our understanding of Looks the really melt break, good. the melt breakup. So here's how it, similar, how it, the UAV takes off and lands. I see flying. And it goes off. Shot to view radio on man 17 Charlie uniform at 500 feet above the South Lagoon. We're going to slowly start working our way south. Shot to view. Hello, 17 Charlie uniform. Touchdown mode. 
So this is this is actually a time when it wasn't autonomous. So they're manually doing it now, and it's much slower. They do a great job, but it's much slower than when the autonomous system just kind of comes in really. And done. So what do we use the UAVs for? The same things we use over the ocean, measuring the fluxes, measuring the how much radiation from the solar radiation comes in. Um, and the ocean, instead of using it for ocean color, the, the hyperspectral camera, we use that to measure how the sea ice is changing itself. So <clears throat> you can see the one that when it opened up fully, the ice breaks off and you can see there this how there's this kind of ponding on the ice already in many locations so in, in tandem with the with the river water pushing or coming down and warming up the, the channel the overall um, ice surface is is melting because of this all the solar radiation and the feedbacks on once you melt a little bit more solar radiation can be absorbed as opposed to being reflected by the sun, uh, the eye, uh, the snow. So here are those same payloads we were using before on the um, Falcor. Um, again, we were measuring the albedo just like we did over the ocean. Over this time, we did it over the ice. So the albedo here is much, much higher. On the ocean, it's down here around 0 .0, 0.05. But on, on, on ice, there's much more reflection, and especially for, for white snow and white ice. But eventually it gets very, once you start having a little bit of melt, it accelerates the uh, absorption and the albedo drops significantly. Which you can see even just here, it went from around 0.6 or 0.55 down to like 0.3, just in one little, one little stripe along the ice. So there's really low, lower albedo out here. So that means it's warming up faster, which this is kind of the break point right here where that, that large chunk of ice came off. This is, this is all the measurements we make. It's probably a little bit too much to go, <laughs> to go over, but it's basically looks at all how we measure the albedo. We'll be a test on it later for everybody. Yeah, I'm just kidding. I don't know why I left this one in there. Sorry about that. But the point was, is that we can look at that see the melt and how it changes over time while we would and we don't have to go out there in person and we can see how so here's the the solar radiation just like i showed before from the from fiji it's much lower it's only around 600 maximum here as opposed to being over a thousand so it's much lower um solar radiation than we would normally see <clears throat> and you can see here here's before Here's before the breakup, whoops. And here's before the breakup, and then here's after the breakup, these flights over here. So that would correspond to these things. And I just wanna point out, the point of these maps shows that how much this change in the reflection, so the reflection is how much of the long wave radiation is getting in. So you can see over the ocean, there's not much being reflected, but over the ice, we have a, there's a lot of reflection, but there's still a lot of variability, especially right here. So clearly right here, it's really starting to, where that breakup is right along the channel is gonna happen. So here is, this ice is still there and then the ice breaks away, right? And then similarly, here's the albedo from the, from the short wave, the same thing. There's a lot more absorption out here on the ocean than there is over here on the ice, except for this one spot right here, which triggers the breakup. Um, and then these are the, this is the, um, the solar radiation and then the long wave radiation. But the key thing is that there's a lot more absorption um, right in this trigger point along the river, which leads to changes in the Hunt season, which gotten, which became, it occurred sooner in the year, but it also was shortened in the, um, the length of the season shortened um, over the last 20 years. 
and then that impacts how the hunters would go out and, and perform their, their hunt. The, um, like in the past, they would have much longer trips, um, even though it doesn't look like it here, there were much longer trips out to where the sea ice was. Um, but more currently, at least for the season we were there, they had the, these, even though it had broken up, the ice flows were closer to shore, so there was, they were able, they would do more frequent and shorter trips out to where their hunt occurred. So that's, that's what I'll leave it at. So thanks for your... Excellent. Thank you very time. much, Chris. Here's a lot of more information if you want to check it out. I think it, this is all on the website, I think. It will be um, on the website if it isn't yet. And I'm happy to provide the slide deck. Um, yes, I would love some of those uh, images for my classroom. Definitely. That's not a problem at all. So anyway, I try to answer questions as we go along. If there's more questions, I'm happy to chat. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop. I'm gonna, let's see, I'm going to stop this so I can see everybody. <laughs> there we go. I still can't see people. Okay, there we, now I can see people. Jeez, that is—I I still haven't figured that out. I don't think you can do that in Zoom. In PowerPoint. Well, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to hang out for a while. If not, I'm happy to share the slides. A lot of very positive comments in there. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Next time I'll have we'll have more about the uh, the results that Carson has. Maybe Carson can come back sometime. So when's your next trip? Next trip? Well, out to um, hmm. we may go out to Kotzebue end of this late April, early May, and. I also have a, a new um, a project where I'm developing a piece of equipment that I'm going to put out on the tower that I showed in the beginning, and I'll do some measurements or some yeah some measurements in a laboratory down in Miami. So do that in in May and June uh, May and June yeah. But eventually, hopefully that that'll go on to the tower off of Martha's Vineyard that I showed. How many of these instruments do you actually design based on your mechanical engineering background? Um, so the the so the UAVs are are, are straight from a, a they're a, a company. They're, um, it was called Latitude Engineering originally, and then they were bought out by L three Harris, which is a big big um, a big company. Um, but the payloads I, I build, we build all at Lamont. And um, it's a, I guess it's they're mostly my ideas and the engineers implement it. And then this cam, this new camera system is basically all my, my idea. But most of the time I, in this case, I bought three, I have three cameras it's a three camera system and I am contracting or designing it. And then the company builds it from, builds it to my spec. So that's straight from my, definitely from my combination of my mechanical engineering background and my early, my graduate kind of applied ocean physics background as well. Combination. Who wants, someone wants to know the price of the drone, really? <laughs> you really want to know <laughs> i'll just warn you he's a retired teacher he's a retired teacher does that okay well the the I'm not drone, certain he's got the money for it probably not i don't have the money for it i get a discount uh <laughs> the drones are 300 just choice <laughs> 350k a piece oh the um 
they've gone up significantly since they were bought by that large company, L3 Harris. When I originally bought them, they were they're still expensive, one one eighty, but they've basically doubled since they uh, since the original original company. Um, yeah, they are they're 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 very sophisticated pieces of equipment. Yeah, yeah. Very lucky to have them. Okay, Chris, thank you very much thank for the next presentation. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We'll let thank everybody you. know when the video is posted. My thanks to Chris for presentation, and my thanks to the other Chris for the recording. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Glad you. Make it. Take care. Thank you so much. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Mike. Bye.